Yeah. Roll call, please. It's noted for the record that all commissioners are present. Okay, thank you. Would you all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, moving to C, public comments. Public comments is an opportunity to address the Planning Commission on items of interest to the public that do not appear on the agenda. Comments should be limited to three minutes. Commission may not take action on items raised during public comments. It is open. Does anyone have anything they'd like to bring to the public's attention that's not on the agenda? I see no one. Okay, then we'll move on. Adoption of the meeting agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda as presented tonight? So moved. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Move on to uh, communications and correspondence. Uh, We've staff. received one email uh, regarding both public hearing items uh, that have been distributed to you before the meeting and submitted today. Does the applicant have a copy of that as well? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, consent calendar, uh, minute of uh, approval from our last meeting. Does anyone have anything to discuss? Uh, uh, deletions? Uh, anything? And if not, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Very good. Moving on quickly to public hearings. Uh, River Marie Use Permit UP. 2017-13 design review DR 2017-14 consideration of a use permit and design review application to allow establishment of a 10,000 case winemaking facility and tasting room on 0 0.80 acre parcel at 900 Foothill Boulevard. I believe uh, our staff's going to do a real brief, if, is that understand? Yeah, real brief. Uh, introduction, and then we'll have it presented then by the applicant, the rest? Abs yes, absolutely. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, Chair, Commission members, Kevin Thompson, Senior Planner, um, this item is a use permit and design review request for the establishment of a 10,000 square foot, or 10,000 case winery at 900 Foothill. Uh, the project includes all aspects of wine making, including a tasting room. Um, I'm just going to go through this real quick and then we're going to bring up the applicant as, as the chairman said. Uh, I did want to point attention to attachment 8 which was the color rendering um, in your packet. The applicant would like to address that a little bit. Uh, they felt that it didn't have the landscaping and there's some amendments to the signs and I'll let them elab or elaborate on that so it's a little bit changed to that one. Uh, also another point of order is that um, if you count the EV charging station, there's actually nine parking spaces. So the staff report said eight. So there's actually one additional parking spaces, this space, excuse me. Uh, the site is zoned and has a general plan designation of community commercial and is in the Down Valley Foothill Boulevard entry corridor. Um, the project does meet all the zoning requirements with the exception of the parking in the front setback, which is noted in your staff report. The Planning Commission has the ability to approve with the approval of a use permit. Uh, we did complete a mitigated neg deck, which was circulated for 30 days. We received two comments, which were included in your packet, and we addressed the, the Caltrans comments. And with that, I'd like to bring up the applicant for a uh, more detailed discussion and some slides. Hello, my name is Jesse Whitesides. I am the architect for the Rivers Marie Winery. I'm here today to explain to you the project uh, that we have designed for Thomas Brown and Genevieve Welsh and what our goals were in achieving their vision. The vision that we were provided with for the Rivers Marie Winery was to create a boutique state-of-the-art winemaking facility with kind of a gem of a tasting experience. As mentioned, it's located at 900 Foothill Boulevard, directly adjacent to the T-Vine Winery, and we will share the driveway. Because of its location um, <clears throat> and our admiration for the small town feel of Calistoga, we felt like the project should be designed as a campus of smaller buildings, consistent with the size and scale of other developments along Foothill Boulevard. So what you see in the slide on the screen there is an overall site plan with Foothill Boulevard at the bottom of the page. 
Okay. Um, the Rivers Marie campus will consist of three buildings, two production buildings and one tasting building. The architectural aesthetic is California Barn with a modern agrarian detailing. Our material choices are simple and elegant and each building will incorporate a dark concrete base with fiber cement uh, rain screen panels and a traditional Shaosugi Bond <coughs> finished oak wood plank. We also have accents of weathered metal doors and a corrugated metal rainwater collection tank on site. Um, visitors and employees alike will come in on the driveway that's shared with T-Vine and turn to the left and then park nose in against a low concrete retaining wall that has a long linear planting strip along Foothill Boulevard. The production buildings are located adjacent to that driveway and the parking area and then adjacent to each other, creating a pedestrian courtyard between the two that leads to the tasting building. The fermentation building is along the western edge of the property and the barrel building is located to the eastern side of that new courtyard but maintains the required access road directly adjacent to the eastern edge of the property. Both buildings have a covered outdoor work area whose elevation then runs parallel to the front of Foothill Boulevard even though the rest of the buildings remain kind of orthogonal to the eastern and western sides of the site. The jewel box of the tasting building sits at the back end of the pedestrian courtyard as the focal point of the project. Um, we have utilized kind of a minimalist door and window system there with glass that allows the sight lines to pass through the building when you're in that courtyard to the farm land and the mountains beyond. The landscape design has been rigorously developed to <clears throat> include on-site biofiltration, riparian plantings, a stormwater garden area to support the seasonal wet meadow habitat that occurs naturally on the site, <clears throat> select areas of permeable paving and the planting of large sized native oaks and walnut trees. The courtyard leading to the tasting room is flanked by um, decorative native plantings to the edges of the production buildings to create a more natural experience for the user as they pass through to the tasting building. The site development as proposed has allowed us to minimize the total building footprint to 9,850 square feet and we're thrilled to see this project come to reality for Thomas and Genevieve. Um, we do have some other slides showing the site plan and some building elevations if you would like me to flip through them and I have a few uh, sample materials I can pass around. Okay, uh, what I think will, I hope this thing's working. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to, before we open the public hearing, I'm going to ask the commissioners if they have any questions of you. Sure. And that way more information we put out will enable the public to respond, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so commissioners, uh, 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 Commissioner Abinell, I'll start with you and we'll just go around. Your microphone. Okay. The requirement for a, a point two acres of to uh, change the lot dimensions, has that been worked out? Yes, our lot line adjustment has been uh, resolved and from Jesse's drawings where our Bio Our beautiful swamp garden is what is going to be uh, in that new lot, the new lot line adjustment. And Jesse's going to show you here. Thank you. And yes, we've taken care of it. Thank you. That's been deeded to them. It's been deeded to them. Commissioner Wilkes. A couple of questions, more site related. Mm -hmm. The issue of the parking in the front and and recognizing that it's below the level of highway 29 um and you're going to have you say a two foot wall uh no it's approximately three feet a three feet wall three mm -hmm. foot wall at the at the front of the parking what will be and pardon me but most of my questions may be landscape related sure um, and is, I don't know if I can answer those, but okay. I'll try. <laughs> but is there, is there provision in the landscape to help to block the cars that are yes, parked correct. there? Yes, correct. 
So when you drive into the parking space, it's very much like T-Vine. You will nose into the concrete retaining wall, and the long linear planting strip is behind that, between the wall and Foothill Boulevard. Yeah. Well, T-Vine has a, a bit of a taller wall that's covered mm -hmm. in vines, and that's really why I'm asking is mm -hmm. whether the three-foot wall, most cars are taller than three, three feet, um, it, it will suffice. Uh, the, the planting that is there is actually taller than three feet. Okay. Um, we actually have full-size trees at a regular sequence and right. then interspersed planting between that. My impression is that we will not see the retaining wall, I don't know, I tops of cars maybe from Foothill Boulevard, right. but you definitely won't see the retaining wall. Okay. Um, secondly, again, <laughs> landscape. Mm -hmm. um, the trees that are going to be in the courtyard between the two production buildings, uh, will they be tall enough to extend beyond the roof? No. No. Basically what's happening there, and you can speak to landscape maybe a little bit better than I can, but the goal of the landscaping there is to soften the edges of the courtyard, basically. So on the winery buildings, we have a concrete skirt that's four feet tall. Um, for forklift protection and, and whatnot on the inside of the building. So the landscape is meant to be at least that tall, not very much taller than that in most cases. Well, you so have three, tr three trees, Shona. And those trees will be, those trees, those trees, well, I don't think they'll be able to eventually in their lifetime become taller than the buildings, but they will become quite tall. And yes, the bottom branches, well, you won't ever be walking under the trees as to where they're placed in the corridor. Okay. But eventually, um, first of all, I'll put in trees that are of a decent size to start with. And then from there, um, as they mature, they will look like trees. Okay. Um, we'll never, people will not walk under them. And while they were picked for their aesthetic attractiveness they're also picked to fit the scale as best as possible of okay. where we're putting it right well I only, I only asked the question relative to your statement of trying to create more of a campus feel mm -hmm. and and breaking up the massing of the, of the buildings it seems like putting trees in between really breaks up the massing of the buildings mm -hmm. and and so that's what I was hoping for in in that regard um, the last thing is is that I'm hoping perhaps when the questions are done uh, I think a number of us are very interested to see the materials. Yeah, absolutely. We and have so, that here. you know, we can mm -hmm. sort of pass those around. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Cooper. I see that the uh, property is located in a, in a flood hazard area. Correct. Have the designs taken into consideration any mitigation or mediation for. Yes, absolutely. Floods? As required by the FEMA requirements, we have flood gates at every doorway up to the required two feet. Um, the four feet concrete skirt that I spoke about occurs on essentially every building. So our floodplain level requirement is two feet of protection. Okay. So that the rest of the base of the building is naturally taken care of by the characteristic of the design of the architecture with the concrete, but we will have to install floodgates at every opening. Mm -hmm. And the electrical equipment, mechanical equipment, everything inside the building is raised above that two foot level. Yeah. Good. And then I, I second uh, Commissioner Wilkes' uh, request on design mm -hmm. and uh, material. That would be good mm -hmm. to see as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Commissioner McNair. I was just looking at the location on site of the, the new large oaks. Those are really 48-inch uh, boxes going in. Those will be pretty large. Are they, They're all clustered in the back. Is that correct, the new oaks? Mm -hmm. Okay. So th these three up, up front along the parking are... And they won't be oaks. Okay. I'm saving, I'm saving, I'm saving my little oak in the corner. Yes. <laughs> I've been there since, I, since I've lived there since 1978. And just it's nice enough to keep that for me. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, and my, my primary interest is, is the details and the materials yep. and the rain screen to see how, yeah. how that. Sure. <laughs> the, box, the glass box is Commissioner Wilkes uh, would like yeah, to. I'm ask sorry, I forgot. Um, yeah, go ahead. Is there going to be any roof mounted equipment? No. There are absolutely, the only penetrations through the roof are actually, we don't even have any. For no vents? Or? We have, no, they're all sidewall vented. We were very specific not to have any openings in the roof. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've heard some things uh, uh, one way or the other relative to the super graphic. Is that. 
something that's going to happen or not? Uh, meaning, meaning will, I, will we update that graphic on slide number eight that you already have? Is well, it, are, you, are you oh, planning oh. on doing it? So I, um, with the, the big thumbs up from the Planning Commission, I'm hoping to absolutely do the sculptured bird that you see. The words Rivers Marie across the bottom will not be there. We okay. would prefer to not have signage. We would like the bird to be art. I've never been more, I mean, I, I drive that corridor every day thinking about the importance of being an entryway uh -huh. building. And um, that's why landscaping is a huge passion of mine coming from my father and that property. Um, the bird that you is rendered on there um, will be made out of metal and its wing hopefully will be up because I very much want it to be art. But as you're coming in from headed north on 29 and you're stopped in our traffic, um, that you're looking at something that's pretty. Okay. Well, I guess that, and, and if it is, a, is metal then floating above it, I was concerned in the roof. It, it'll you know, be on the side. A couple of winters and all of a sudden the the red bird is brown, um, so it so water would just pass underneath it. Correct. It's meant if we're it, the idea is that it's kind of a steel laser cut, you know, powder coated or painted object. Yeah. That follows the profile. And it would be building. on standoffs. Then. It's on standoffs. Correct. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. And it also says in here backlit metal signage. Is that for, was that for the letters or was uh, that for the bird or for the bird? The bird. Oh, okay. So it, at night it kind of makes a silhouette. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I guess I'm up. Okay, so first of all, I support family. You know, I think this is great, that part of it. Um, the first impression I got, and I suspect you're gonna know what I'm gonna say here. I, I swear, I used to be in aviation, and I'll leave it there. I thought it was two aircraft hangars, and I also found out from staff that you were concerned about the graphics that we got and what was being proposed, and you were concerned about it's going to be softer than that. It's not going to be like we see in attachment eight. So that was a concern of mine. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to hear about the landscaping and trying to soften everything. So I certainly want that addressed tonight at, at, at great length because I have major concerns and you have brought them up. The, we, this is an entry corridor, probably the, one of the most sensitive areas in our community. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, is a big question mark for me. You know, it's the not that I'm against the project as much as what I see when I drive into town. You talk about the parking. I drove by there today to take a look at mm -hmm. T-Vine. And you can see the tops of the cars, but the foliage is coming in nicely. And it's probably in another year or so will pretty much disappear. So, and you've kind of addressed that. So mm -hmm. that relieved that concern for me. I do have some more things that we'll talk about later. But so I really would like to focus, on, for me anyway, and because I asked several people in the community about this, and actually two people, the first two people I asked, thought the same thing I did. So that brings up a, a real concern to me as that it's something that's going to fit within our community. Because there again, we talked about that country feel, you know, we're hometown, we're small, um, we can be eclectic, of course, but I just want to get a better comfort level with that. So through the discussions tonight and share it with the public, okay? Mm -hmm. do, do you want me to speak to that? Or? You certainly may, and that will allow the, the people in the audience okay. to, to get a better um, understanding what I, as well. I, I want to address attachment eight because we've had a lot of discussion about it between right. us. And so, that's what I'm referring to. Um, that for us is a tool for me mostly, and when I sent it to the planning department, it was mostly a tool for them to understand the signage that we were talking about on the side of the building, namely the bird, because the lettering, you know, is undecided whether it's there or not, and apparently we don't want it there. Okay, it was not. <laughs> it was not necessarily intended to be, you know, widely distributed. Um, it's you can see that it represents landscaping inside the campus, but not to the outside of the campus because we were looking at the buildings when we had that made. Um, in terms of form. Um, one of the reasons we selected the materials that we did was because the fiber cement panels, the Shaosugiban finish, the concrete, all of these materials have a higher resistance to mold, bugs, water damage, and the spread of fire than most other siding materials. Um, just to give you some background on some of the selection there. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I can so send this around if you guys want. We have it in, the, in our uh, podium here. 
Yeah. Wanna... Because this was, a, this was uh, again, as you all can imagine, this was, Mr. Coates, this is, this is my hometown too, and I've lived on that property since 1978. So for me, it's a big deal, what it looks like, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, my my better half of, of 17 years being a great winemaker, okay. I want to make sure it's a facility that he can okay. do his craft at and then make sure that I am proud as a Calistogan of what it looks like. And uh, this materials that are going by, this was, this, this was a, a good six, eight months of us trying to find a way to broach both, yes, it's a facility that we can actually use and make our wine, and yes, it's an, an entryway building we can all be very proud of. Okay, and, and I appreciate that. Um, and one of the things that, excuse me, and I kind of know the products, um, that the, the view that we see here is, is a level in front and not from up here going in. So you definitely down and in, which is a, you know advantageous to you to break the building up and, and from the street. So I understand that part, but uh, just comments. I, I represent the public. I don't represent myself. I represent the people that live here. And, and, and getting some comments after we receive this as public information, um, just wanted their reaction. And, and so it was there, and it certainly is, this is the place to address it and make sure that people feel comfortable with it. So that's why I brought it up. Okay. Okay. Any other uh, comments or, or questions from the commission? I will open up the public hearing. Are you all set? Okay. We'll open up the public hearing and anyone that would like to speak on this issue, please feel free to come forward. And please give your name and your address if you would, please. Wonderful. No controversy, no controversy here. Oh, here we got somebody coming out. I live at 912 Hotel Boulevard, adjacent to the property, and I have a few concerns um, about the traffic coming in, the noise, and the smell, and who's going to monitor the two extra crushings? What's to say they won't have 10 or 20 crushings? And there's a lot of noise comes from crushing, as you know. So that's, and the hours are they say 7 to 10 p.m. So, I mean, I think that's a bit much. And they said they can have longer hours, so I don't know if that's going to be earlier in the morning or later at night. You know, we live right next door to 900, so I would like you to take that into consideration. Very well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else out there? <clears throat> Excuse me. Just feel free to come up. Uh -oh, my name is Martha Castleman. I live at 1602 Cedar Street. Not just a couple of blocks from, from them. And um, they didn't ask me to come tonight, but I, I would like to speak in support of the project for many of the reasons that were cited, which is that the entrance the entrance to our town is sometimes not so beautiful, and I think this will, as, as well as giving them a chance to develop their skills and something beautiful, it will certainly enhance that, that corridor um, coming into Calistoga. So I, again, I'm speaking in support of the project. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jim Rigushi, 5584 Silverado Trail. I own T Vine and Tank. And um, when this project came about, when we developed T Vine and Tank out um, originally, we came before this and thank you for granting everything that we did on that. And it was one of the things that was brought up as the gateway to town, the gateway coming in. And we were praised at the fact that we were developing and doing some projects there on the gateway coming in. And I looked at it then, and we've improved it. The uh, Mexican restaurant across the street, or the grocery, has done a great job. That whole corridor is kind of developing out and turning into a nice entry to the town. And I look at the piece next door where um, Thomas and Genevieve are doing, and it's one of those things, it fits. When I looked at the plans, I went and looked at the plans and walked the property. For me, it fits right into that kind of zone and that type of thing. It just adds to the gateway coming in. Also. It's one of those projects I look at 
I don't know if this means to take into consideration, but it's not someone else coming into the valley. It's someone, this is a home that was grown up as a family property. I own a winery down on Silverado Trail, and it's a family property. We've been there since the 1800s, and it's one of those things where I look at this project. For me, it fits in the envelope there that it is. It also ties in, we're sharing neighbor, neighbors as you enter that driveway and everything, and it just kind of, um, it's a simple application for me when I look at it, that it makes sense to, to tie it in there. So I'm here speaking in favor of it, no question. And the other side of it ties in for me is it's one of those, it's damn near turns into a heritage property because it's family and it's gone from a home where Genevieve grew up tied into the next part of where a family business is and then it's something that just ties in to the family and continues from there. So I look at it as we crush grapes and we, we, we um, make wine there and we, in five years now, I think it is, we haven't had one complaint about noise, about smell, or about any of those other issues. So I can't see adding another. There, the timing is about the same. You have the nights that you run, and it's a short window. And it's only a 10,000 case winery. So it's not massive amounts of semis or anything else coming in. That's what, the way I look at that. So. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else out there wish to speak? Okay, seeing no one, I will close the public hearing and retain the right to open it up again if it becomes necessary. Uh, that being said, comments from commissioners, and we will start with Commissioner McNair. Well, I saw the rendering, and as an architect, I understand where you're coming from and using it as a process drawing, and uh, some renderings do buildings great justice, and other renderings are really more useful when you're just looking at the masses and the materials and the shapes of things. So I understand that that perspective. It seems edgy and fun, and I think that's exciting for Calistoga. It does come across as a solid dark mass in, in this rendering, and so I was looking at those materials that, that were passed around, looking for texture and looking for relief and looking for... Um, those materials to do a good job of softening up the solid dark mass, but at the same time, we all know that a nice dark facade will will go away, more than more than something brighter or um, multicolored or flashier would uh, tend to stand out in this spot. So th those are my general thoughts about the project. Uh, I am curious to hear, and maybe we can save some questions and you can address them all once we make it make it through. Um, about the acoustics of the covered crush pad because we know that crush it, it can be noisy and I'm wondering if there's any way that you've accommodated that because sound bouncing around in that little box next to the neighbors could be something that that needs to be paid special attention to just to be neighbor friendly and then hours during crush is something we should probably discuss as a group Mr. Cooper. well I certainly <clears throat> appreciate the comments uh, of support and um, from community here and I appreciate Jim's comments that of course uh, in the past five years there hasn't been a noise problem for T-Vine so that's a good indication of what we can expect and I, I really do like that it it will be a Calistoga family heritage property um, that feels so much better to have someone from the community who understands the dynamics and why we're here and the reason we're here uh, and can uh, work within in those, those uh, confines so I'm, I'm definitely in support of it I'll defer designed to the architects, um, but I definitely like it. I think it's striking, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Commissioner Wilkes. Um, the, a, a few observations, and, and I will mention specifically the, the concept of an airplane hangar. The, uh, the, the things that, that would suppose me to be more supportive of it is that the scale of the buildings in real life, which is poorly represented in the rendering because you don't get a sense of scale of surrounding scale, but the scale of these and the scale of T-Vine are not unlike one another uh, in terms of the mass of the buildings. And that I am also very supportive of the darker colors, knowing that darker colors with a, with a green surrounding just tend to make everything disappear. Um, I recognize that looking, and I did the same thing, first blush looking at the drawings, one immediately goes, oh my God, the whole thing is corrugated metal. And, and 
The biggest fear I have, I have nothing particularly against corrugated metal, but, but the biggest fear that I had about that that has been mitigated by your materials is that you're using non-reflective materials. And so there isn't anything that's going to bounce back at you. And, um, and so that I, I, can, I can say I'm very supportive of the project. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Abernathy. Well, I built airports all over the world for where I work for Bechtel, and this would be an awfully small airport. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. So I really don't think it looks much like an airport. But uh, the project has a great feel, I think, and uh, I think it'd be a welcome addition to the entrance of the town. Great. I have, uh, and thank you for the, the samples and things, and like I said, the, the attachment aid is hard. It, when you and you've explained that to me, and I, I, you know, and I drove out there and I sat there and I look at it and I and I see why you were concerned and I get all that. So I'm going to go a little. Ten, I just need some explanations, and either one of you may come up. And by the way, Genevieve, I believe you grew up with my children. I believe you all went to school together, so we're all kind of like family around here. So I do understand that, and I have enormous respect for your father, whom I consider a friend. Uh, so that being said. It's good, it's local. Um, I, I have a couple of technical questions about the parking, and we're talking about seven spaces, so, and that's fine, you have five employees, and if they're working, if you have an event, which is, I'm sorry? It's nine. No. nine. Well, you have nine, but, but okay, I'm going, I'm sorry, I, I'll, 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 nine, but it's seven, if you don't count, if you start eliminating the ADA, you, okay. Well, where I'm going with this is it's just an explanation, really. If you have, I think, four events with, with a maximum of eight people, is that what I read in here? Is that what you're anticipating? If that were to occur and you had five employees and let's just say, I know I'm being nitpicky, nitpicky but each person had two, that would be four. We'd be up to 11 spaces required and five of them are not there. I, are we going to be short or are we going to have a problem? I don't know how you're going to set up this arrangement or if you're going to have all the employees there at the same time. I just know that parking in this community oh, is so sensitive and, and you've tried to address it. So it's just a clarification. Um, well, I'll clarify first with Thomas and I don't let our employees drive. Um, okay. So, no. um, we've thought about that often ourselves mm -hmm. um, and thought about different ways that we will be able to have our employees park at our office um, and not drive over if, they, if, if it is not needed. Also to that, we put in the um, permanent package that of course we want to have a few parties or the ability to do that. We don't foresee being that. That's not sort of what we do as um, as a as a wine company. Um, so, to your point of parking, I think we have enough for the size of the project, and I think that any time we would consider doing an event, it would be so incredibly thought out, and I would I personally would be so in charge of bossing everybody around about how we would deal. Um, I, yeah, I, that's that's those, those are, that's the real answer. In that, uh, we'll continually try to use the space as best as I possibly can, thinking of town, parking, my neighbors, and everybody else. See, I'm holding you to your word here now. Um, so, and, and that's fine, as long as you, you know think where it I through, live. And, you know, because it is a problem. Absolutely. And, and you have neighbors, and, and, and you don't want to you know, have an issue with that. Which brings me to my next question. Um, noise, which there's a few yes. letters about that. Absolutely. A very sensitive area. And I'm going to bring up um, Thomas, because he being the one who will run production and has been doing it for 20 years, um, he can give a better answer as to what noise is like for us. Well, I really am going, and that's great. I would love to hear from him. But where I would love to go with this is yeah. that if there are issues, we are a small town, and we're all, I always like to think of it as a family. I always have. I've been here 40 plus years. That if there is an issue, that you would be, you know, open minded and open handed to, to talk to your neighbors if they have a complaint, work hand in hand with them to try to resolve those issues if, if this were to be approved. I mean, I can imagine living over there, and, and I, yet my office is right down by uh, Crystal Geysers. Right. And I will tell you, I don't even know they exist, but they've taken measures and they've made it work. So it gives me confidence in where, where you're going with this. But I want to be want to hear you say to me in public that, that you're not going to ignore your neighbors. They're, you know, they live here too, and that you're going to work together to make sure that, that it isn't in, in too intrusive into their lifestyle. The neighbor that I most affect um, 
is somebody I, I have liked my whole life and okay. I've lived by her my whole life. And because I affect her, I, I will absolutely be completely working with her always. Very good. Thank you very much. And I would like to hear about the, the, any kind sure. of uh, noise. Um, just architecturally to answer the question because you had asked it as well. Um, one of the things that we've done along that western edge, there are absolutely no openings in the building along that side. The covered crush, um, if we were to go back a few slides to maybe the front page, yeah, that's, and then get rid of that. Um, I'll just explain it here, and, and then if anybody wants me to point or not. In the production buildings, you can see that the buildings themselves kind of have a rectangular shape, and they are orthogonal to each other. And then the covered work area sort of peels away and comes to the front where it's parallel to Foothill Boulevard. That creates at the fermentation building a very deep covered crush area. The internal material of that area is a four inch thick insulated panel. Um, if we have to knock the sound down more, we can talk about putting a softer material on the surface to the inside, but there are no openings to the neighbor in that direction. It faces only foothill and the buildings to each other. So any reflected sound is not traveling west. Okay, great. Um, and then the other, and I, uh, Mr. Brown, maybe you want to address this. The other concern I have, and it's been, t and, you know, y even in the letter we got today, traffic is going to be an issue, and I, I suspect the biggest impact would be during certain hours, because as we know, when you go to the intersection from three to six, traffic runs in both directions. Or a very, and if you're trying to do your operations, you're crushing at a given time with big trucks. Can you just kind of explain to us all how you, you see that working out? Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, Thomas Brown, 1418 Cedar Street. Um, Crush is busy sort of regardless of where you are, unfortunately. Um, I think some of the assumptions in the, uh, the submittal are a little aggressive even for what we're going to be doing. Um, to give you a kind of a real world example of how I see the winery working, we'll be crushing probably from 10 to 4, maybe 20, day, 20 days out of the year. That's about it. I think there was a larger time frame put in there just to cover some very odd circumstance, which we don't plan on having happen at all. Um, we end up working about 75 consecutive days during harvest. So my goal as an owner or winemaker is always to get people home and get them sleeping. Um, so we don't foresee working beyond, say, 6 or 7 o'clock in, in the evening. And the crush activity for us is usually limited from about 10 to 4. It takes a little while for the grapes to get there. We immediately start processing them while they're cold, and we try to be finished by 3 or 4. And that's in a facility where we do 400 tons. This will be a facility we probably realistically do 100 to 120 tons. So those crush windows are going to be pretty small. Um, in terms of traffic in front of the winery, most of what we do, even from a hospitality standpoint, will be wrapped up by four. And I noticed in the letter that was received today, she specifically name-checked sort of 4 to 6.30 as a, a concerning time period. Most of our hospitality concern will be completely finished by then. There will be people working till maybe five. And the employee count for us, we have listed at five. <clears throat> it's probably going to be more like um, three or four year round. Um, and we plan on having maybe one or two tours a day. So you're talking about a traffic issue with maybe a, a group of four leaving there around three or 3.30, and then employees leaving around five o'clock. So I think the, the level activity is, is scary, especially when you read the description. But I think the, re the reality of it will be a lot less noxious and how the description reads. Okay, and, and so do you have the capability, um, if there were some issues, and now I'm only going to during the periods of crush when we, you have bigger trucks, things going on, a little more activity, is, are you able, if it becomes an issue, to modify that somewhat, if, you, if it were to be pointed out? I mean, in your schedule when you do your, your process? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, so we, we can easily um, okay. just uh, sort of tweak it a little bit. To give you an idea, this was a pretty, two, two pretty intense days. But at another winery I run, we did 100 tons, which we feel will sort of be the extent of this project. We did 100 tons in two days uh, across 16 hours of total crushing. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that are possible for us, spreading stuff out, condensing things, crushing on, you know, additional days for shorter periods of time. Whatever sort of the neighborhood needs, we'll be glad to accommodate. Okay, and that, that's important. I think if that's a, that's a working relationship with your neighbors in the community, I, that's what I wanted to hear you say, so... Yeah, I, I think from the, the previous ex my previous experiences, communication is the most important element to having a successful winery. Usually that has to do with um, 
communication with everyone in the neighborhood just so no one gets taken by surprise. Um, and I think in this case, especially with Barney and Genevieve's relationship with Edna, I don't think that'll be an issue. And I know it's trial and error. You're going to have a few hiccups that's given with anything, but I just, I'm glad to hear you say that because I think that's very important to the neighbors and, as I said, to the community as a whole. So, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Any Tom, questions? Of, yeah, yes. Thomas, um, can you speak a little bit about what is the noise related to the bottling operation? That's actually a little worse um, than Crush, to be honest with you. Um, there's a little more forklift um, traffic, which in the most, probably the worst sound that we make as a winery is the backup beeper on the forklift. I was going to say, can you get ones that only go forward? You can, and we'll just go in a circle, basically. <laughs> but um, that, that is actually sort of the loudest sound we probably generate by a decibel level. Um, we've been asked at other wineries, of course, to disable those, which is illegal and incredibly unsafe. Um, and bottling has a lot of forklift traffic. So the goal for us for bottling at the winery is three days a year total. Okay. And right now, if you took our traditional bottling days, it would be one day in August, one day in December, and one day in June. Um, and during the bottling runs, which are usually anywhere, start time anywhere uh, from seven to eight, and we run till four or 4.30, there is some clanking of bottles that you hear. And I would be willing to bet that's a little more of an intense experience for the neighborhood than actual crushes. Crushes sort of remarkably quiet with the modern equipment. The bottling is still a little bit loud. Okay, thank you. Those bottling activities would not be in the evening. You'd have those during the day, during normal working hours probably. Yeah, I mean, like you'd be associated. A, couple, a couple times we've had to get a little crazy with the bottling schedule to get it all done in one day. And mm -hmm. those days were seven to 5.30 something like that okay. that's an that's an idea of a really gnarly day and this would normally not be done on the weekend this is normally during work or working hours during the week this is uh, monday, okay monday through friday All for right. sure well, you get noise in general so okay yeah very good exactly answers my questions uh, any more uh, questions of uh, mr brown i just well not necessarily of, of thomas but i the one question that occurs to me relative to circulation and kevin perhaps you can answer this um uh will there be left turns onto 29 from exiting this project yes and with t vine having been there for a few years now has that ever been a problem yes there's been no accidents okay thank you okay thank you Okay, um, I guess uh, we need a motion. Do a motion. Okay. There I are, move that there are two. So, well, we do the yeah. Okay. Um, we we'll do them individually. Yes, please. Okay. I move that the planning commission adopt uh, the approval and initial study. Uh, mitigated negative declaration. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And secondly, I moved uh, that a use permit and design review to allow construction of a full scale winery, including tasting room at 900 Foothill Boulevard, and that includes the reduction of the parking to a five foot setback, um, be approved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, very good. Thank you, good luck, and please be considerate of your neighbor. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, the back is gonna look really good, but. <laughs> we'll take about a two minute recess while everyone settles back down.
Appeal AP 2018-1, consideration of an appeal filed by Tapa Apps on behalf of Tadema, if I got that right, Incorporated, uh, regarding the planning and building director's determination that rooms rented by a bed and breakfast facility may only be located within an existing structure. Staff, please. Thank you. Um, as described in detail in your written staff report, there is a complete chapter in the zoning code that um, sets out regulations for bed and breakfast inns and facilities. Um, there is also a definition in the zoning code that um, pertains to B&Bs. Um, Mr. Epps is uh, appealing a determination that I made uh, when we were discussing whether additional guest units could be added to the Pink Mansion B&B. Uh, there was a carve out for five properties uh, back in 2010 that are lo located on the south side of Foothill Boulevard and there are certain exceptions that the Planning Commission can grant. Uh, to these properties if certain findings are made and one of them is that they can have up to 10 rooms again on a case-by-case -case basis if findings are made um, and uh, Pink Mansion was approved for eight units in 2010 uh, also Chanwick Inn was increased to seven units and Aurora Park was increased to seven units in 2015 also the um, resident manager requirement was waived for two of those projects. Um, so back to Pink Mansion, um, my determination was based on the definition of B&B that it uh, is in part the rental of rooms or space within an existing structure would apply. And um, while uh, two rooms could theoretically be added to the eight at Pink Mansion, uh, my belief was that it would have to be within the existing structure and could not allow new construction on the site and that is the basis for the administrative appeal um, by Mr. Epps on behalf of Tadima uh, Incorporated who are new owners of the property. Um, if the uh, Commission does uphold uh, the director determination it may want to discuss um, whether it's appropriate to amend either chapter 17.35 and or the B&B definition to uh, al possibly allow the construction of new structures or B&Bs in the R110 zoning district or B&Bs in general throughout the um, community. So that's not something I would necessarily be opposed to, but as it's stated right now in the definition section, it specifically limits um, the rental of guest rooms in existing structures. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions of staff at this point from any commissioners? I have a question. <clears throat> oh, okay, Commissioner Cooper. Assuming that um, um, that the director was explored in terms of um, initiating a code amendment, what would be the time frame for that process? Um, it's a somewhat lengthy process because it has to run through the Planning Commission who makes a recommendation to the City Council. Um, so it would take a couple months and then it's 30, effective 30 days after the second reading which are two weeks apart at the City Council. However, if we know that um, the first reading has been held on a zoning ordinance amendment by the Council, we've always been willing to go ahead and work on a project while we're waiting for the subsequent reading two weeks later and then the 30 days to kick in so okay so 60 to 120 days in that range yes okay, okay thank you Mr. Wilkes yeah um, not specific perhaps to this project but in general in a B&B &B, if you cannot increase the existing structure for the B&B &B purposes could the existing structure or an outbuilding or whatever be constructed for the owner's purposes. Yes, we have allowed, um, for example, at the Francis House, certain buildings to be added that are is the owner, resident owner, manager, um, garage, um, residential storage, those kind of accessory structures that are accessory to the residential use on the property. Um, at the Pink Mansion, there is not a resident manager, so that possibility doesn't exist. But um, in most of the other B&Bs, there's a requirement for a resident manager. And that, that's 
one of the primary purposes of the B's and B B and B's in the other zoning districts, not the R110, but to maintain a residential character to the operation, a residential appearance. So um, besides these five particular operations, that's the goal in all the other districts is to maintain the residents. And then the B and B operation is accessory to that. This is, uh, these five properties, there's a special situation that we've created here in the R110 to allow them to be, under certain circumstances, to be wholly commercial operations without a residential component. Okay, um, I'll continue then the one question, and, and you and I have had this conversation a little bit before, but if you, if the owner, which in effect is signing an affidavit when they apply for a building permit that says that they are, doing this addition and it's for their own purposes um, and they do that and they go ahead and construct it uh, on the day they get their occupancy permit they would be permitted to to apply to amend their use permit or for a new use permit to add that into the BNB per theoretically they would yes well because it would be an existing uh, assu assuming it was all in compliance with the regulations of the BNB would that take away the theoretical aspect of it? Uh, they could apply for it, yes. I mean, we, we, you know, we could share that it had been applied for as, you know, a studio office or something for the, you know, the main purpose is the finding that it remains accessory to the residential use okay. on the property. I mean, I, the the definition is just as it's worded, so. You know, it doesn't specifically say that it was an existing structure that was specifically, uh, you know, constructed for residential purposes right. and is now being converted to commercial use or anything like that, so. Uh, would you agree, based on my example, that perhaps the wording as it exists may have some holes in it? Oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other? One quick question. This letter that we received implies that um, that they received approval for something that isn't currently being uh, utilized. Are there are there eight units currently? Um, yes, I'm not really clear on, on what that's referring to. So everything that that was applied for in 2010 is now happening there and are in eight use guest and active. Rooms. Okay. Yeah, there are eight guest rooms. Yes. I I had a question. That the applic the appellant's letter here says that the intent of the of the decision in whenever it was 2010 it was not the intent to restrict the guest units to structures existing at that time that's pretty categorical but you have a different opinion on that well they did not amend the definition of B&Bs and um, I found that during my research that the definition has often gotten forgotten about because it's not embedded in the actual B&B &B chapter so it's easy to lose track of it um, so there are some staff reports that don't mention the definition at all. So when they were looking at loosening up certain regulations for the R110 district, unfortunately, that was not one of the ones that they included. They included the resident manager waiver, parking, you know, potential parking reductions, and a number of other things to allow them to grow. Um, and um, how many units they can have. But unfortunately, it didn't address the definition at the same time to say that these units or whatever or improvements could be accommodated in new structures, which which would be an option if the commission wanted to pursue that. We could fold that into the R110 exceptions that they could apply for. And then it would be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis for under the use permit modification. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? This is a public hearing. I will open it up to the public, and uh, probably the best thing is the applicant to come up and. Uh... So my name's—I uh, know some of you, some of you I haven't really met yet. But my name's Tapa Epps. I reside at 1511 Foothill Boulevard. Uh, I previously owned the subject property, uh, the Pink Mansion, for 24 years. And um, I guess I should address this letter that was written asking how do I have authority at this point to even be here before you. Um, I say an act of God, really. Um, 
the Chin family who purchased the property back in July of last year offered me and my wife the chance to work with them on uh, this particular property. Uh, they also bought Bosco's Restaurant, if you haven't heard yet, and a few other properties in Napa. And they're the most unbelievable family I've ever met. They're just fantastic. They would be here tonight. They're actually in Japan, so they couldn't be here. Uh, but they've given me uh, the authority to speak on their behalf. I am actually Calistoga property manager of all their properties in Calistoga. And I think staff is aware of that I'm speaking on their behalf. Um, so with that being said, I um, address that. I, um, this is um, kind of an interesting situation where um, Mrs. Goldberg, she's been very nice to us, but um, up until two weeks ago, I never knew there was a definition of a bed and breakfast. And I've owned one for almost 25 years. She actually brought it to my attention. Um, she said, we, we need to go back to 1983 and, and look at these two words that we'll probably be discussing a lot tonight, uh, existing structure. And so uh, over the last two weeks, I've been kind of thinking about this meeting. And it, it's just the word existing structure, it seems, it seems so easy when you first hear it. But I can guarantee you, if I asked you, the five of you right now, are we in an existing structure right now? And how long has this particular building been an existing structure? You would have difference of opinion. And so we'll come back at that at the very end. I want you to just think about that for a second. But before we do, I do want to uh, say, um, I think I'm the only one in this room. Paul, you might have been on city council back in 2008. I'm not sure. Um, but other than you, there's probably no one in this room other than myself that was a part of, of the meetings that went on. Existing structure is one element of why we're here tonight, but also in the discussion, we need to talk about the intent of the Planning Commission and the City Council in 2009 and 10. When I, when I came before them with several property owners, um, th this actually started the year before. We were all in the same uh, boat in 2008, the housing crisis that affected all of us. And at that time, uh, I, I was struggling, almost lost my house. Um, Christopher Layton, Nick Kite, uh, the Chanrick owners, uh, Aurora Park, I'm not sure who the owners were at that time. Uh, they were the ones that actually started the movement to say we need a few, we need, we need to not be limited to six rooms. And um, they went before, I think it was uh, uh, Charlene, Galinda, is that who it was? And um, Eric, Eric was there, Lindquist. And we started the process of discussing, is there any way that we can move beyond the six rooms? The bed and breakfast industry at that time was changing, it's really changed now. It's not like it used to be back in the 40s and 50s where grandma was there and you kind of shared a bath and all that. It's, it's, it's totally changed with Airbnb now. And it, it's, you know, I was 23 when I bought it. I was 23 years old when I bought the property. So it's, it's not like, you know, you think. And, and um, so with that being said, there was a meet, there was a, a group of B and B owners that got together and said, "What can we do?" Christopher Layton spearheaded it, but he actually dropped out at some point. And, and we all got together, and they didn't want to change the whole ruling for everyone. What they wanted to do is start with the ones on Foothill Boulevard, and my, if I can remember correctly, that was like the big corridor into Calistoga. And there was a select few. I think there was five, and I think they're on your uh, your report. Uh, that they said, okay, we're going to start with these five properties and we're going to allow them to, to expand up to 10 rooms. And uh, they also agreed to allow us to have off-site manager and, and then we also only had to have one parking spot per room. So all that was discussed with the Planning Commission. Um, they sent it to City Council. City Council sent it back to the Planning Commission and they adopted it and sent it back to uh, City Council and it was voted on. I don't know if you have the staff report from 2010. I actually have a copy. Do you guys have that? No, probably not. Okay, we'll forget it. But if you look at all the minutes and, and everything that was, um, I mean, they met in September 23rd, 2009. They met again in October 20th, 2009. December the 9th, 2009. And then the second time it came back, there was a subcommittee that was formed. And that was man Freddie and Moy formed a subcommittee to do further investigating, a subcommittee to go over all this. And then it went back to, to council and it was adopted. 
And I bring all that up for this reason. This is, this is what's kind of important to, to kind of feel. And you guys, of all people, should know this. The intent was to allow us to have 10 rooms. And I'm saying this with all sincerity. No one on the planning commission or staff ever brought up existing structure. It never, it never came up. Why would someone meet for two years, two calendar years, 2009, 2010, and go through all these committee meetings and everything to allow a code to be adopted that no one could do? The Pink Mansion is the largest 6,800 square feet, and we do everything we can to have six rooms in the main building. There is no way Aurora Park, they're just cottages. The place next door is a two-bedroom. Nick Kite couldn't do it. There's no, if anyone could have done it, it would have been us, and we couldn't do it. With all due respect, it has come up. I'm sure Paul's been there. A few of you may have been to the Pink Mansion. I'm not sure. When they say that, that we can't add two rooms now in the Pink Mansion, you know what they're saying? Take out the swimming pool and put the two rooms in the pool. We have a 1958 pool, an indoor pool. It's heated. It's the only one in Napa Valley that's legal for bed and breakfast. That's what we're up against. We could do it. It's 70 years old to put in two guest rooms. Or we could be allowed to do what, we, what the Planning Commission vetted. It's already been vetted and done. It's been done to allow us 10 rooms. If it was so important back then, you would, you would, you would see that in the report. You would see it in the minutes. You would see it discussed. It's, it's just not here. There's never a mention of it. And I, I appreciate the honesty of Mrs. Goldberg saying she, she had to kind of dig around and find it too. And in her research, she, she's not found there was a discussion about it. So imagine if you guys make a ruling on a property or something, and then 10 years later, someone finds a loophole to basically stop your ruling. And that's what's happening tonight. And with all due respect, she has given you kind of an out, kind of a middle ground, it looks like. I appreciate, Scott, you asking the question how long it's going to take. 120 days, pop, that's on the good, that's the good, if everything goes smoothly. It's, it's too long. We've waited over six months. It's not your situation. We, we, the project's been delayed already for a different reason. Um, but what's right is right, and, and I was a part of it, and that's why I'm so emotionally attached to this, is, uh, you know, this is their first venture into town, and this is the very first thing they tried to do, and they can't even get off the ground. For two rooms, we're talking two rooms, that's already been vetted. It's already been passed. Two rooms for us. I guess maybe there's three or four there, but it, it's just the right thing to do. And, and I'm asking, um, actually, you know what? I'm gonna t I wrote it down, so I want to make sure I'm clear with this. Because um, I don't know if I'll get back up here again. So uh, as staff suggests, uh, an ordinance amendment is not warranted. The Planning Commission has the authority to interpret the zoning code and address this matter tonight. If the Planning Commission directs staff to initiate an ordinance amendment, staff time and city resource would be wasted processing an amendment that has already been vetted by the Planning Commission and City Council. Scott asked how long it would he take. What he didn't ask is how much money it's going to cost. It's going to cost the city money going back and forth for something that's already been vetted. It's unnecessary. The Planning Commission could confirm tonight its previous intention in 2010, and you can streamline this whole process. My suggestion would be that the Planning Commission, by motion, find that the intent of the 2000 Municipal Code was to allow qualifying facilities and opportunity to develop further, including the addition of new structures. That's what I would ask for you guys to do, is to do the right thing. And I'm going to give you an out. She kind of gave us an out at middle ground. I went back, I said earlier, what is an existing structure? What is it? When, did, when, did, when does it start? Perhaps that's why the Planning Commission back in 2010 didn't bring it up, because they knew when we build the structures, they will be, in essence, existing. The moment I'm finished building them, there's no one going to occupy the buildings until they're built. And Mr. Wilkes, I think you were right on it when you were asking about it. I can actually go down tomorrow, thought about it, and ask for two accessory buildings. Can I get two accessory? And by, by, call, by code and law, I don't see how I can be denied. And then after they're done, I can come back and say, okay, I, want, I changed my mind. I want to make those now my two guest rooms. But why be dishonest? Why play that game? I'm not that kind of person. It's not who I am. 
but I could have very easily done that. I'm asking that you guys do the right thing, please. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, David Patel, 1807 Foothill Boulevard, representing Aurora Park Cottages. Uh, I was questioning myself when this uh, definition of a B&B &B and being able to expand within your existing structure came about. And I think uh, Ms. Goldberg uh, kind of finally gave me some clarity to how that happened. Um, to give you a little background, we bought Aurora Park Cottages in uh, the beginning of 2015. Uh, the seller had indicated that it, we had the ability to grow up to a maximum of 10 units. Uh, we went and vetted that with uh, the planning department, the fire department, uh, and, uh, and proceeded with uh, purchasing the property. Uh, we then came in front of you guys in, I think, two, or later on in 2015, uh, changed the existing manager unit into a rentable unit. And uh, we, you know, there's some con confusion then. I think there, were, there was a neighbor here that wasn't too wild about us expanding to 10 units. But I don't think it was ever, you know, I think everyone was aware that was our intent. Uh, we had subsequent uh, dealings with the planning department and public works and uh, basically have spent the last year uh, developing architectural and, and civil uh, engineering to uh, submit. We were, uh, I was doing a preliminary sub, uh, sit down with uh, Kevin last, a couple weeks ago. So, you know, we're in a situation where we've, we've actually spent a lot of money and we're ready to come in and uh, apply for uh, growing three additional units. And uh, this has come, come up. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, you know, that, that's a concern for us. Uh, it's pretty clear that the, uh, this definition, I guess, in the, the Calistoga Municipal Code um, has escaped uh, others in the past. And I, I'm guessing that's why we're sitting here uh, having spent a bunch of money and, you know, I guess, in theory, possibly uh, money we shouldn't have spent if this came out in the beginning. So uh, obviously we would uh, urge the commission to give the direction to uh, you know, look at the ordinance and, and do something that makes sense and is logical. Uh, the last thing I'd add, I mean, in our case, we have seven buildings, seven units. Uh, so you know, this, I, I agree with uh, the, the applicant or, you know, B and B is what they were maybe 30 years ago. It's just not the way it is today. In a lot of cases, I think you can look at new projects like the bungalows. You know, that's three units, three structures. So, I think just a common sense approach makes sense. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else out there want to come up? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And yes, Mr. Commissioner Will. We can have him come back up, even though it's the public hearing is closed. He certainly can come well, up and answer any question that you I have. So. I'm sorry. I meant before you dashed off. I meant to ask you a question. Um, what have you prepared plans already for what your addition is? So yeah, that's exactly. We're in the same boat. <clears throat> we, uh, the uh, property owners, are are Asian, and so they have. Uh, they're not. This is kind of their first time dealing. With, uh, understand, with understand that so they have they have done preliminary we haven't submitted them yet and I actually told them to stop because now we need to decide what our next move is mm -hmm. so they're on standby right now um, waiting for this decision to see and, and it's, it's a like I said there's a lot of things you don't know well, what is the status of what they have done give me an idea uh, I wish I'm not an architect to, to but they've they've done a, a conceptual preliminary conceptual design I guess I should stop for a second and tell you. <clears throat> this is what I didn't say. We were going to do a PUD and uh, change the entire zoning and add 30 rooms, which was a, which was somewhat, I guess, recommended by uh, people in the in in city. I don't know with the planning or, or anyway. We'd, we've had discussions with the city manager, with the mayor, uh, off off the record about the possibility of putting in 30 rooms. The 
we didn't want to go on the delay uh, uh, of possible a year to do a PUD. So then we decided, okay, it makes more sense for us to stop and just, and the other thing was the pink mansion was going to come down. And we, we had some negative feedback with that. And what uh, the Chen family decided to do, because they're new and they're so humble, is let's save it. And let's don't cause any trouble and let's try to keep it the best we can and we'll add a couple cottages in the back. And so now, with them trying to save it, there's been a pushback where if there is a pushback further, I don't know how, the, I don't know what their next call would be. If the, well, I, I mean, I appreciate okay. that this is a story, but I asked you, what is the status of their design right now? There's, there, they have done design work for the 30 room in, and it's been no, no, squashed. No, and not, no. so right now, they, they're, to answer your question, uh, we've got an architect in Santa Rosa. It's just preliminary. Okay. They're, things are just preliminary. I can't say anything. That, I haven't seen the, the submitted plans. Okay. That's I'm in constant I discussion with them, but I haven't seen anything because they're saying, Top of what's the next move? Everything is on hold until tonight as far as presenting something. I can't really answer it much more than that. The, late, the lead architect is in Tokyo. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, other commissioners, any questions before we move forward? Well, yes. Len, is, is it your view that if, that if, you, if this were to go forward, the only way to do it is to change the municipal, municipal code? Um, that's what I'm recommending. But is that the only, that's... Well, there is Mr. Epps approach, or, or as uh, Commissioner Wilkes suggested, that if a building is allowed to be constructed for whatever purpose, and then it's now an existing building, is it possible to then convert that to guest units? I think the, the reality is that the existing verbiage within the code as it is has this statement and so I don't think there's intent to impede the development you know but it was uh, agreed to pop it up to 10 back in 2010 so the ultimate question is um, according to rules and guidelines what's the most effective way to clear this uh, clear, the, clear the question off and if this uh, the recommendation of, of going through the motions taking 60 to 90 to 120 days is there an alternative to that because it doesn't seem you can just go in and automatically change the code and the flip of a finger um, no I mean there is a set procedure in the municipal code for changing it and while I agree that the intent might be to allow for new structures in the R110 unfortunately the definition wasn't addressed at that time I should just mention in 1983, I believe, when the original B&B &B regulations were adopted, it did allow for new or guest units to be located in new or existing structures, and then in 1986, the new was removed um, to limit it just to existing structures. I wasn't able to find enough in the record to understand why that was removed, but um, there was a specific change in 1986 to delete the words uh, new, the word new. Um, that was in 1986. So and that then, was yeah, 32 you know, years then ago. Then it was amended a couple other times after that, and again in 2010 it was loosened up for the R110. Well, it seems like the appropriate step now would be to clear things up because not only is it impacting this applicant, but it's also right. impacting other applicants, and by doing it right way getting the I, books clear it it opens up possibilities for other applicants who are waiting in the wings yeah, it, it seems that if you have if you have an ordinance that was written in 1983 with a definition and then a subsequent ordinance that was written in 2010 allowing these 10 units you've created a catch-22 um, there's it, it, you know you can't get there from here as they say in Maine and so I, and at the same time, the language of the definition is very explicit. Um, I mean, there's no way to dance around that language um, other, than to, other than to say, and I will tell you very frankly, what, what, what we approved on the Francis House, which they signed, again, a building permit application, which is in fact an affidavit that said that they're adding these facilities for their own use okay and when the building is final we may see an application for an amendment to the use permit I wouldn't be a bit surprised um, so I I'm torn because 
the language is if if the insistence tonight is for an up or down vote the language is explicit existing structure no ifs ands or buts and if we don't have an ability to interpret that any other way and you can't interpret existing structure to to something that we were thinking of um, and so in that instance I I would I would feel compelled to have to support staff's view at the same time I would say that I think that there is a fundamental problem with the definition written 32 years ago that perhaps needs to be revisited because it's evident even tonight that this isn't going to be the first time we're going to see this and and so it it would probably be behoove us to address that now if it takes time to resolve that through the ordinance process correct me if I'm wrong but that's not an expense borne by applicants in that can't that be directed for staff to pursue um, either way I mean the the applicant the repellent can apply for it or Commission can direct staff to initiate um, the action and make a recommendation to City Council but if it's our direction it's not not a not an application being right. paid yes. for by the oh, you you have to pass the hat sure yeah. up at the 1500 <laughs> well so I needed. that's only 300 each I mean I for one I I just um, the the definition is is faulty on its on its surface and I and I think that it needs to reflect what the world is today and I think that it's probably probably needed to be revisited a long time ago and and probably nobody found it until you found it <laughs> um, the other thing that that you mentioned earlier is that it is clear from previous projects that to one degree or another this has been overlooked and I well and I will just say a rule unenforced is unenforceable <laughs> I'm not going to speak for my predecessors <laughs> I, I just wanted to note that we have approved more than six for three of the five facilities uh -huh. and whereas you know 10 might be allowed and that doesn't necessarily mean that every property is appropriate for 10 agreed units for whatever reason so um, I just wanted to clarify it wasn't necessarily that everybody was entitled to 10 because Chanrick Inn actually uh, applied for eight and that eighth unit was denied and they were limited to seven um, that wasn't necessarily a result of new or existing construction that didn't enter into it but um, there were concerns well that expressed but, that but, limited it to seven units so I'm just saying you know we can we can make these changes but again it's not going to but that's on examination of a project by project right. basis project project which, project which, project. which is what you always have to have and and we're not and since we don't have plans we don't know whether this would you know pass the bar of a, on a project by project basis or not that's something working with staff and working through the process uh, discovers but in this instance we don't even have the opportunity to just to do that and then the next question is would this just if you were supportive of amending the either the regulations for R110 to allow new structures or all B&Bs to allow new, new structures that would be something we would ask for uh, direction and guidance on because we do have uh, well regardless of how many B&Bs we currently have it would apply to B&Bs in the future if you were to allow new structures so we currently have um, 16 B&Bs and they're located in many different zoning districts throughout you know the downtown and in other areas so that would be again if you were to allow it for all B&Bs um, you know the possibility of it um, through use permit review that's something else to consider some of them are very small properties and it really wouldn't uh, be um, uh, possible and then also those properties have a limitation on how much of the site can be used for the B&B use it has to be primarily residential so 50% of the floor area has to be devoted to residential uses so by simply modifying the the definition 
we, the definition would be applied widely to all of those, but it would ha get down to the case-by-case -case basis and the zoning and the specifics outside of this group of accept, accepted mm -hmm. groups. Or you could amend just the R110 provisions as were amended in 2010 to carve out an exception to allow new structures just in that district, as that you did for you know allowing up to 10 units and waiving the resident manager requirement and reducing the parking itself. That would be preferable to stay with the R10. The, yeah, I, the, putting aside the, these five properties that were carved down, um, I, the definition and the definition including those five properties, the definition could be changed across the board without changing any of the development standards, right. any of the standards, of, and and that um, and that by that nature it would it would still have every project on a case by case basis, and in terms of if we were to to make a motion and 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 approved a direction for for the staff to to try to give a new definition or revise the existing definition in terms of guidance, I, I think that the, the one thing that I would say is that clearly the, the fundamental difference between a B and B and an N, this is notwithstanding the new environment we all live in, but, but the definition by, by the difference to me is that a B and B is subservient to the fact that it is in a residential neighborhood with families living in it. And it must always be subservient to that. It's not in a commercial district. It is a commercial enterprise, but it's in its nature and its look and its feel, it, it needs to be subservient to where it lives. That's the difference between that and opening a hotel. Um, and I think that if you can just take that in some level of recognition, but come up with something that that they doesn't necessarily hog tie everybody to the ability to add anything, um, it would you know that I think would get us there. And then we would have the ability, for instance, to look at this project on the merits of the project, and yet as would you, which you haven't had the ability to do. Now. That's not the issue before us tonight, unfortunately. We need, we need to either do an up or down vote and, and approve your project or, or, or appro well, approve the denial. Right, or, right. Or, or we would ask you to, to ask for a continuance or we would ask you to withdraw the application or, or the appeal and, and, and we could then move on to whether we wanted to direct staff to work on the issue. Can we handle the uh, recommendation to staff ahead of, and then let the applicant um, decide if he wants to withdraw or? That's up to the chairman. Okay, so let's back up a half step and, and, and let's talk about the end run, which, and, and, and I know Tapa, he's an honest man and, I, and I've always felt that. And true, he could go out and he could say, okay, I'm going to build a couple more units, I mean, accessory buildings, and then I'm going to come back. And we talked about the, the time it takes to do this. Well, that's a big gamble because you put the units up and you get denied. You got two pieces of, uh, two buildings out there that got whatever value they have, and you didn't get approved to do that. And it's going to take you a lot longer than 90 days to do all of those things. So I'm kind of going back to where we're talking about here um, to try to help. And it is a delay. I've already been in that process for a week with staff, and I got nowhere. Not staff's fault. I'm, she knows what I'm talking about. But it, it, was, it was trying to figure out how, how things are written and trying to understand them. And you, and you are right on top of that. It's antiquated. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, there's an opportunity without where I approach it without, I think it is the responsibility of the city, and I think this commission agrees that it's our obligation to step up and say, okay, we need to fix correct fine-tune this t t to today's standards and where we need to be going and, and so it does not cost you anything the only thing it's going to cost you is a little is a bit of time to try to straighten this out and that's kind of I think where we're, where we're coming from here so I guess the question has arisen you don't have to do this you can certainly appeal this decision if it goes against you tonight to the council right 
and and run into more time and if you don't get it then you everything changes or if we can work with you and try to expedite this and and, and have and direct staff to get the verbiage right so it gives you and 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 the patels and all the other folks in the r110 those f i'm working on the five right now and i think that's where everybody's coming from that were identified and 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 give you the opportunity to, exp to you know to move forward and and improve your properties so that's kind of where I'm standing from. So I guess the question to you is, and I think uh, Commissioner Wilkes brought it up, would you be willing to withdraw this and then work with us and try to move forward from this? And, 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 and I would certainly like to direct staff to, to expedite it as, as fast as possible, and I think the Commission would support that. Yes, you may. A uh, couple things. One, is uh, when you mentioned uh, Mr. Wilkes that it's black and white it's, it, it still really isn't black and white or we wouldn't be here it's really not and I, and I, I would ask if you could pull the staff report and look at the definition real quick on, on uh, what we're talking about do you guys have it in front of you it's, yeah. it says background if you could read that where it says the rental of rooms or space within an existing structure for the purpose of providing overnight accommodations for paying guests for a period not to exceed 30 days. What does that tell you? What well, I, you just asked my, what, that it isn't black or white. I, I guess I should clarify when I said it was black and white. It is my opinion that that is black and white. So okay. that will be the way I will reflect it. Okay, I, I get it. Could I respectfully ask for you to give me your uh, opinion on what it means that we cannot exceed 30 days? Bed and breakfast cannot exceed 30 days rental. What does that mean to you? That means you can't have a tenant living there for more than 30 days. And you would be incorrect. That's not what it means. I can have a tenant live there for 30 years if I want, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. And the planning will tell you. They will agree with me. It means if someone stays 31 days or longer, I don't have to pay TOT tax. But you would never know that because it's not black and white. It's left out. It, it, and I'm saying that respectfully. When I first read that, I'm like, what does this mean? But I researched it. That's exactly what it means. 31 days or longer becomes long term. Okay, let, let, let's just. Okay, okay we we're, not, we're not okay, really. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're not so, arguing stop, that. No, 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 stop, I stop, that. No, stop, oh, stop, okay. stop. This is interpretation. This is, this, is the, this is the crux of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Your interpretation, your interpretation, right. my interpretation. We need to become uniform. To become uniform, we need to address the issue. We need to go back and have it crafted, working with you and with you, Mr. Patel, those that are going to be affected and, and, and expedited to the best of our ability because without it and this, this, this indecision, I'm going to be real frank with you, it's not going to bode well. Okay. So I'm trying to... To, to get us together. I totally agree. I'm a, I, I'm a family man, and I've expressed that every I, day. I to get it together, he, work together. It's a delay. But in the outcome, I think, is going to be beneficial not only to you. I truly think it will be beneficial to the community. But we have to take a pause here. We really do. And no, I don't want any more. I do not want, and I'm going to tell you right now, and I very rarely do this, I do not want any more discussion about interpretation. We have heard yours. We have heard the Commission's interpretation. And so I'm going to say right now, we're going to bring this to a vote, and we'll see where that goes, and then we will decide what we want to do to direct staff to amend the municipal code if we feel that is appropriate. Okay, I appreciate I just wanted to say that. I, I didn't mean no offense. I was just trying I know to you, say I know that you there's... Well, and I, like I said, I totally respect for you, but we need to bring this to a close, and we need to move on. And, and my question, and this is the last question, is before you, is can you... You, we all know the intent of 2010. Can you, can you not, it was vetted already. Can you not vote on that aspect of it and not just the black and white thing? You can't do that? No. Okay, all right, fair enough, thank you. That being said, I would like to entertain a motion to uphold the staff's recommendation and we will then proceed to the next step. Do I have a motion? I'll um, move that the Planning Commission uphold the Planning and Building Director's determination that rooms rented by a bed and breakfast facility may only be located within an existing structure. Do you have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That being said, 
I would like, do we need a motion on this staff or do you just need a consensus to ask you to, to move forward in an expeditious manner working with these, and I would like to say in the, in the R110 and those that have been identified, I think there's five, to try to amend our municipal code to address the concerns tonight. Well, and there's two options. With the definition. With, yes, yeah. with the definition of two options. Can, is that a, is that a. Is there a direction on which option you want to pursue? Is it just applying to the R110? I think we're splitting yes. on the yes. R110. Yes. Yes. I, I, I think that there's benefit to re repairing the definition of B and B in general. B, right. Not specific to these properties because that you would like would to do it across the board, right? It's okay with me. Yeah, I think that's better. So, I mean, can we do that by consensus? Yes, yeah, that's. But you don't have to make a formal. Okay, motion, so you have a consensus the, here. Okay, so of the consensus like to basically is to strike the underlying phrase within an existing structure. Pretty close. Now, Data, is there a need to even address whether it's new or whether it's existing? It seems like we would just strike that phrase. Because it's across the board. It would be across the yeah. board. Then also, if it is technically going to be a given or an assumption that that's going to take place, then in good faith, the applicant should be able to move forward with designs on their Well, this side. would be a recommendation to the city council. Right. And we can bring it the second meeting in June. Okay. June 23rd, 25th. Okay. Anyway. And then we could follow it. It has to be at least two weeks between right. the Planning Commission and the City Council. But so expedite to the best of your ability yes. to help the, the applicant. And, and, and it's kind of giving you some direction tonight to work with his owners. And, and But at least we're not going to let it dally. And that is always a concern with anyone that's out there with something like this, that it could sit there for months and months and nothing happened. And, I, and you've heard um, the consensus here. We don't want that to happen. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll agendize it for the second meeting. Okay. Of June. Um, absolutely. If you have something else, you talk. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't know if we're able to do that. <laughs> yeah, but that's not. That's so. Okay. Not that's yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on if I can find my agenda. Ah. Okay, matters initiated by commissioners. I think we did of that and then some. <laughs> okay, director's report. I'll wait for Mr. Obsley. Uh I'd like to recommend that you, um, oh. I was gonna recommend that you cancel the June 13th meeting for a lack of agenda items. That wasn't lack of staff going on vacation to uh, tropical places or anything like that? Mm. No. No, no comment. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. I just um, was inquiring. But, um, yeah, I don't. 30 days wouldn't would. give you enough time to hit both meetings. Yeah, I, I don't think we could advertise it and everything in time for the June 13th meeting. Okay. And prepare the staff report and have it vetted, et cetera. So, and okay. yeah, yeah, just the noticing procedure. So, okay. Is that it? All you have? Okay, well then I guess I'm entertaining the motion to adjourn to so the next, uh, like, not regularly scheduled, but when we're, oh, you're going to go on June, on June 27th, that's going to be scheduled. More Maybe you in. could, um, just so I don't have to think on my feet, which I don't, do, <laughs> um, if it's possible for us to meet the noticing guidelines and the staff report and everything, um, in order to hear this zoning ordinance amendment, would it be, you'd be willing to meet on the 13th? If necessary, yes, because okay. we said we would do do it, take okay. every effort to facilitate that if, if, we, okay. if we can. Let me let me look at the hearing deadlines and every, uh, the noticing deadlines and everything when I get back to the office. Okay, very good. Okay, that being said, I have a, a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> have a good, long, quiet, safe holiday. <laughs>